So I didn't uh, <laughs> actually didn't really prepare a slideshow. I wanted this to be pretty informal, uh, kind of give my thoughts on it. I guess I've I've been uh, active in sustainability and trying to convince brands and retailers for years uh, that America produces the best, uh, most sustainable, environmentally friendly cotton crop in the world. Um, this U.S. Trust Protocol, I mean, it's definitely, it's, it's not something that the cotton industry is just doing. Uh, it, it was, I would say it was started and it was called for by our customers, the brands and retailers. Um, I guess I spoke at a conference, it was the U.S. Cotton Sustainable uh, Conference, Sustainability Conference in California last year, and it was put on by, uh, I guess, Cotton Board and Cotton Inc., uh, and it was mainly millennials and purchasing agents from big brands and retailers, and uh, it, it was something different because I think it was a meat free, meat free. The whole conference was, and there was no plastics anywhere. We had cardboard forks and spoons, and I, I, I think I had an iron deficiency after three days, and not even <laughs> red meat. But uh, kind of the takeaway from that is, is one, for the first time in kind of the history of, of, of environmental and sustainability is, is people have always had it on the radar and say nice things about it, but they've never been really willing to pay for it. Well, what they find out is now consumers are, especially millennials, willing to pay for sustainability, environmental friendliness. Um, the other thing is you saw earlier, these, these companies, so it, when meeting with these people at, at, at major brands and retailers, Walmart, Target, a lot of these companies have this poor person they've hired and the board has made a decision that they're going to be 100% sustainably sourced. Well, what is sustainable? What, you know, where, where, who defines it? Where does it come from? I don't think the, the, the sustainability uh, managers for these companies really care. They just need a product that, that has some form of sustainability certification so they can meet their goal. So that's where it really came from. I mean, the, the biggest one out there, I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of it, is BCI, the Better Cotton Initiative. Um, the issues, it, BCI has lots of issues. They're very, very good at marketing a product, but they're not very good at, at uh, I think in America they have two employees. Um, they're very good at selling a bill of goods to brands and retailers, but have not, uh, not generally been able to follow through. I've been a BCI certified grower for years. Every farmer in America should be easily BCI certified. The problem with, with it, is uh, it takes money, <laughs> and that's where BCI is. is uh, and so I had brands and retailers tell me, we don't want 100% of American cotton to be BCI because I guess the way that they are able to pay, or BCI is able to exist, is the brands and retailers have to eventually pay them money for using BCI cotton. So that's what the Walmart sustainability director said, if every cotton bale in America is certified BCI, I can't use American cotton. We can't afford it. We're not going to do it. So. Uh, I guess this is kind of a, uh, in response to all that, the trust protocol was started. Um, again, I don't really trust BCI either. I feel like over the years they've tried to throw in socioeconomic factors and say just because we're an advanced country, we, we're, not, we're not environmentally friendly. And this, this person in Africa or whatever growing cotton hand picking it, they're way more environmentally friendly. Uh, I think those are two different, <laughs> two different things. Uh, so uh, I'm excited about this because uh, again I, I don't particularly trust BCI anyway uh, so I guess signing up for the trust protocol last year uh, that's that's going to be the big hurdle is to get farmers to go on this website and sign up and I mean first we have to get out there as the industry people that come to these meetings because you know for every person at this meeting there's there's 50 more farmers you know that don't go to meetings and don't really get out and may read some trade publications. But how important this is. It, it's an opportunity, it's the first time that I've seen, is an, I mean, being on Cotton Inc, National Cotton Council, uh, Cotton Board, things, going to those meetings, I've always thought there should be, we should put American cotton on a pedestal. I know uh, CCI does, and, but, the, but a lot of times they're just promotion of cotton in general and it'll bring up the whole uh, consumption of cotton in the world and, and so we'll get a higher price. This is one of the first things I've seen that we as American cotton growers can differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world. We can say this is American cotton, it's sustainable, uh, and I guess the ultimate goal is, is to have enough people to sign up that American cotton for all these sustainability indexes so when, when Target's buying clothing and, and has a mill in China make it, they say, well, is it sustainable? We want sustainable cotton on this. 
Well, the mill in China calls Cargill and says, hey, we got to have sustainable cotton. And Cargill says, hey, we got, we've, got, uh, we've got this American cotton. It's all U.S. Trust Protocol certified sustainable. So uh, I, I don't think immediately, you know, you're going to see a three cent premium on American cotton. But ideally, eventually, uh, we're, we're making it less of a commodity and more of a, more of a product we can sell with American cotton. Not only that, it might be the difference between selling cotton and not. <laughs> so uh, I think long term for the industry, it's going to provide some stability uh, and, and provide maybe some premiums at some point for American cotton. Uh, we already have almost a traceability, and I see, I guess in the future, maybe some traceability coming into this. Um, I think it, it uh, so, and that's, I think that's where we're heading, where when somebody goes to, to Walmart and buys a shirt, you can trace it all the way back to the field that it's grown in. And, and this is one more step towards that, I would say. Um, so as far as the practicality of signing up, I, I did it last year when it's still a pilot program. I mean, it's, a, it's an hour process. I mean, and I would say every cotton grower in America would qualify for this. It's not something that you're gonna have to change at this point, change your practices. Uh, I mean, pretty much all cotton farmers are doing variable rate fertilize some form of conservation tillage you know you're not bringing out the break and plow every year and turning over everything uh and, and so generally i mean to stay in business cotton farmers know we've had to come we, for our farm it, it's not just saving the environment it's us staying in business i mean we, the, the margins are so low we can't go out and, and till every acre every year and 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 things such as that and and you know obviously the explosion in cover crops i mean that's a that's a big deal with this but i would say pretty much every farmer every cotton farmer in the country is going to qualify for this the biggest hurdles are the the uh i guess the verification with the field print calculator or some other thing i mean that's they have it linked now on the website so you go on and and when you get to that point you have to f put in data uh, and and it spits back your field print calculator uh, I guess that Dr. Barnes kind of had a big, big part in, but it, it tells your, I guess, what is it, your sustainability on that field? Is that kind of the? Yeah, your field, they call it field print. Yeah. Yield, water yeah. use. But it's, it's not a, it's not an insurmountable burden to do. It's, it's a, uh, what, 45 minutes maybe at the most. Um, so, so that's probably the most difficult thing about signing up for this trust protocol. And then the other issue is the, the second and third party verification. Um, I would say that's probably rarely going to happen. I would say if it, if it does, it's probably going to be like a second party, like your cotton merchant calling you and asking a few questions because they have a meal of asking some questions. Uh, I guess a true third party would be somebody independent coming in, but, but that's probably I would say a very rare chance that's going to happen, isn't it, Ken? Is that see you back there? Small percentage. Very, very, very <laughs> small percentage. Uh, but uh, also look at it this way: I'm I'm pretty cheap, and uh, the American cotton industry has spent a lot of money to get this program going. And if nobody takes advantage of it, it's really going to be all for nothing. So uh, I guess just getting the word out to neighbors and family and, and uh, signing up for this is, is just a, I guess what, what we need, everybody needs help with in, in the industry. So, is there any questions? Um, yeah, yes, sir. Nathan, you don't know me, but uh, Bill Long. I always say don't let a third party goods carry you over a second. Yes. All it is is going to do is verify what you put on the phone. Yep. And that's where Ken can. And if you're, if you're going to get the truth on your phone, yeah. they're not. Yeah. But in the third party has to be in there, isn't that kind of the hang up? I mean, third party has to, not that it's going to happen, but. Okay. Part of your brand for retailers, uh, yeah. in order for them to part of their 100% sustainable yeah. purchasing, uh, defines standards, which that's the questionnaire, and then a uh, verification process. Yeah. That's part of it. And that's why, I mean, this whole program was designed to cater to brands and retailers, correct? I mean, it, essentially, what, what they're, tell us what your needs are and we're going to make this for, for y'all. And Well, I would also say it's, you know, just the industry kind of responding. And yes. Yeah, I mean, we know this kind of growing pressures out there, but, you know, we kind of have to do something and uh, just 
I also think like to some degree we know we're doing the right thing so it's just here's our opportunity to kind of <coughs> tell that to the world like, we know we're the most highly regulated and um, you know the most efficient highest yielding highest qualities so we know this already but this is just an opportunity to say look we're doing this here's the data you know we're not scared of anything we can look at it so and that's what as we as farmers don't get in front <coughs> I mean, I guess in the past, I would say we've been guilty a little bit of not getting in front of things. This is a way for us to get in front of all this. I mean, we can see it's coming, and it's a, it's a big deal. So when you use protocol, you answer the questions, mm -hmm. and then do you get like a score, or you just answer how you want? You're certified. Like, how, how so, does, yeah, so kind of. Someone's not going to be able to answer A to, to all of them, right? Yeah. And if, if um, I'm, I don't know. I mean, so can you get to that? Yeah, exactly. So that kind of goes back to the uh, previous point I just made where we kind of know we're already leading edge and most technologically advanced, highly regulated, that sort of thing. So we're not necessarily saying that if you don't use cover crops, you're out. Like The bar is basically, okay, you're a U.S. cotton grower, you're following the regulations that exist in growing cotton in this country, um, and you will consider different things over the years. If you answer the questionnaire and say, I'll consider, maybe you're not using cover crops, I'll consider it in the next three years. So say if you um, say that, it doesn't necessarily mean that in three years someone's going to show up on your farm and say, ah, you didn't do that, got you. It's just basically, okay, yeah, I should probably do that. And it gives some level of accountability to doing better and kind of Have you ever seen a BCI form? So. so like the first five pages on a BCI form are asking about slavery. Exactly. So, so I mean, it's it's relevant. just that's what we're our competition is on this. I would say. So it's. So yeah, we're not trying to kick anyone out or anything like that. We're basically, if you're following the regulations, then you're you can be in. Obviously, you have to jump through the hoops of, you know, filling out the questionnaire, doing the fill print calculator, and then potentially being subject to this verification. And that gets back to the again. That's why I showed that second slide from our market research. I mean. As consumers, I mean, this kind of is putting pressure on the brands. Again, they, they want transparency and they directly correlate that to trustworthiness and responsibility. So this is just our way to kind of verify this process to get more transparency and more trust to the process. So I think we uh, chose that term, kind of trust protocol on purpose there, <laughs> try to build that trust. So, so BCI obviously had like a head start on this and it's the pilot year biggest thing to me it seems like is getting these brands on board and making sure they're you know cotton trust is the same as BCI you know, I can partner with them because a lot of them make commitments to others mm -hmm. how has the push with specific brands gone so far I know it's not gonna happen overnight but like we said their goals are all somewhat subjective yep um, yeah it's a good question so it's basically asking how BCI plays and kind of where that fits into the brand equation and how protocol fits into that as well. So we have had very good uh, conversations with BCI. Ken's had a lot of conversations with Alan McClay. He's kind of the director of BCI. And then we have good relationships with some of their other cotton folks. And they're very excited about this program. And I think at some point, our goal anyways, is to try to make protocol and BCI kind of some sort of uh, substantial equivalency so they would basically be able to, if they say, okay, we're using BCI or protocol, would almost be interchangeable. Of course, some of the components of the BCI questionnaire aren't relevant. So, yeah, like I've heard, he said this before, it kind of, you almost take offense to it when you go yeah. through it. If you're like, wait, slave, like we have OSHA and worker protection. We have, again, back to the regulation, we have all that in place here. So it's a non issue. Um, so then we'll have this data link to it too. So I think we'll have some kind of competitive advantages to them perhaps, but at the end of the day, I think we would like for protocol and BCI to kind of almost be on the- But BCI would be better right. served if they kind of went back to their core initiative of, of trying to get basically third world countries to, to be more yeah. environmentally this friendly. This the trust protocol seems a lot more simple and to the yes. point and applicable to the U.S. farmer. Yeah, and don't, um, the trust protocol, you guys have some brands and retailers on the board of directors, oh, right? Yes. So yeah, that's they're point. getting insight yeah. about, yes, I think this could work, you know, yep. for, for our brand. Mm -hmm. And they're getting a lot of that um, inside information directly from brands and retailers. Yeah, it's a good point. And it made me 
want to mention that there is a governance board that was formed late last year during the pilot phase, um, and it's representative of the entire industry, the whole supply chain. You have uh, producers on the board, you have warehousemen, crushers, um, merchants, co-ops, and you have some researchers, and of course you have brands and retailers, and we have civil societies on there too, so it's definitely this kind of multi-stakeholder thing that's driving this uh, initiative forward, and um, I think, yeah, go ahead. I was going to add just one thing <laughs> about brands and retailers. Um, he showed that uh, graph of the, the lower tier to the upper tier. Well, the upper tier, um, brands and retailers want to make these uh, environmental impact claims, um, whether it be on greenhouse gas emissions or, or carbon initiatives or, or uh, water, um, um, conserving water. Well, uh, back to that field print uh, platform or, or calculator. Uh, as, as U.S. producers enroll into this uh, um, the protocol and that data is captured, then we're going to be able to take that aggregate data. And if, uh, if a Levi Strauss is trying to make an impact claim to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by this year, we, we will have that data to be able to aggregately that the U.S. cotton that they purchased of the protocol cotton um, is 30%. As, it equates to 30% reduction of greenhouse gas. And so it's, those, those are the type of things that we'll be able to validate for brands and retailers. And, and I actually think that as time progresses, that more and more brands and retailers will find that information um, uh, beneficial. And I can, can see where they'll want to buy U.S. cotton before any other growth in the world because of that data. Because there's not any other, uh, other in Australia, there's not any um, operation that has that. The developing nations don't have that data. Yeah. We do. That's a good point. Got a quick question. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I may be way out of line. Nathan knows sometimes I get Yeah, you're out. You're out of line. <laughs> um, with the implementation of the RFID technology, uh, with John, you know, John Deere figures, we can take the bale production back to the actual right. acres it came from. And when a, grow, when a warehouse gets a layout from a merchant, I guess, that says, here, I want this, this grade, this staple, pack on this truck, right? Do you think eventually we'll get where each bale has a sustainability score? And if that's conceivable, what, who's, you know, are they willing to pay for it? Um, I'll take a crack at that. I, I think the goal of this program is not to say that, well, I know it is, it's not to say one bale or one region is more sustainable than the other. Our goal is to kind of lift the entire U.S. industry to allow them to operate in this space. So uh, I'll say that. I will say that, sure, I mean, perhaps the opportunity is there with these technology. I mean, you could potentially trace it back. I think it would be difficult because uh, I went to a spinning mill late last year in North Carolina, and I mean, they had 180 bales, or sorry, 108 bales in their lay down for some of these operations. So I think it'd be, it gets a little challenging once you get past the mill, but I think perhaps you could track it up to the mill. I mean, they know what bales they're using, but I mean, some of these brands want like product yeah. level, like this jacket came from Nathan. Like a single source. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like a single barrel whiskey. I don't know, I, I mean, I would have to talk, get Ken to talk more about that. I don't think that's, but, that would be maybe like a way down the road thing, and the brand would have to be willing to pay a lot more for that if that was something they're interested in. But Ken, in. don't you think, I mean, by doing all this, at some point there could be some form of traceability in this? If it's called for that much, Which, uh, as the um, we call it critical mass, as the yes. volume of the program increases, um, then you can you can follow the pro if you have customer form of protocol cotton and specific protocol cotton, then you can follow that bell to the mill. Yeah. Again, as I was talking with Isabel here, once the bands are broken, then that, uh, that uh, PDI is gone. But you can only talk about it so far. Your brands and retailers or your mills will have to help. Well, that's what if, if the brands and retailers want it that much, surely they could get the mill to say, you know, you can separate Because, I mean, it's something. just it's the matter of a computer program of it came from one of these, whatever, 100 farms. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, gets, it gets a little bit more confusing when you're overseas. Yeah. Different groups in there as well. So it's, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I think we had maybe time for one more in the very back. Do you still have a question? So,
I'm not running down BCI. It's just in the past I've been like, ah. There are some things that I would love to change too. But yeah, but the reason that we're here is because we're trying to find ways to make the great relationship with BCI moving forward and something that we can both be happy about and adopt instead of you know some sort of competition there. So glad you're you here. Thanks for being here. Are y'all looking at collaborating That's with question. other commodities? Um, collaborating with other commodities, I at the moment I don't know any uh, I know the other commodities have their have their sustainability programs. Um, the exactly. trust protocol is just completely cut. Yeah. We uh, have I, I do I think there's we have a platform in place, um, whether or not some other uh, commodities a couple of years from now need to use our platform to help with their uh, story, and that's a possibility. I think it's important to note the field of market is multi-commodity. You know, that's corn, soybean, rice, yeah. <coughs> peanuts, alfalfa. Yeah. I mean, so that part of it is already on the multi-commodity. We do have a project uh, that's collaborative where we're uh, focusing on cotton producers that rotate peanuts and. We even talked to them about this program as we've developed it, and they have been interested in just, wow, that's pretty cool, and not necessarily joining our program, but maybe doing something similar at the very least. So, yeah. Um, they cut us 